So hi, hello, yes, I'm Matthew Somerville. Um, as, as Simon said, a, <clears throat> a web developer based in Birmingham. Um, over the years, I've done a number of different things, um, both consuming and producing open data. Um, just some examples, uh, I produced a live map of the London Underground using the open data um, produced by TfL. Um, a bookmarkable train times journey planner, train times to all UK. Um, an online database of theatre productions, um, and even somehow found myself running a find your nearest postbox site, um, which used data released by Royal Mail and um, in under a freedom information request and um, OpenStreetMap data. Um, I work for my society, uh, which is a charity that helps people be active citizens. Um, my society runs websites such as Fix My Street. Uh, for helping easy reporting of graffiti and potholes. What do they know uh, to help people make freedom of information requests? Um, and they work for you to help follow what your MP and other representatives get up to in Parliament and other national assemblies. Uh, my site also runs some services, and the most important of which for this talk is one called Mapit. Um, Mapit is an API that maps points and postcodes to administrative and other areas using a variety of um, open data from um, Ordnance Survey, Office of National Statistics, um, and so on. Uh, the screenshot there is an example of the postcode for Birmingham New Street, showing the ward, council, constituency, um, NHS, uh, clinical commissioning group, and other things that uh, cover that location. So um, I realise people probably want to try and forget a lot of last year, um, but let me take you back to July 2020. Um, restrictions were easing in stages back then in a similar fashion to now. And on the 4th of July, restaurants could reopen, libraries, cinemas, and you could meet with one other household indoors, except in Leicester. In response to the high number of positive tests, the government had announced a local lockdown in Leicester and the surrounding areas. They passed the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Leicester Regulations 2020, um, in which Schedule 1 to find the protected area, as it was called, to define whether restrictions would be in force. And they did this by providing a ginormous list of postcodes, postcode areas, uh, it covered the whole of LE1, for example, and even individual addresses within particular postcodes if the whole postcode wasn't to be included in the protected area. The, um, if you printed out the list, it was 24 um, A4 pages. I'm guessing that they thought or hoped they wouldn't have to do this very often. Um, but they quickly learned this would not be the case, I guess. And a couple of a couple of weeks later, they passed the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Leicester Amendment Regulations 2020, which reduced the area covered. Um, it did so by getting rid of the entire list of postcodes and instead replacing it with the area covered by two councils, the councils of Leicester and OB and Wigston. Um, just as an aside, all the underpinning legislation I mentioned here is available at legislation.gov.uk, which is a great website if you're interested in the law. Um, the people working on it have done an amazing job keeping up to date with such a, a lot of legislation coming through very quickly on coronavirus and without even mentioning the other huge amount of legislation due to Brexit. Um, it's all open data and is available in a variety of different formats, such as um, XML, RDF, and uh, Akoma Natosa, which is an international standard initiative in some information. So by the end of the summer, um, some or all of Greater Manchester, Lancashire and Yorkshire, either councils or particular wards, all had various nationally imposed restrictions. And then by mid-September, they'd been joined by parts of the West Midlands, the northeast of England, the Central Belt of Scotland, a couple of Welsh councils, and another long list of postcodes covering areas in Northern Ireland. Uh, so this map shows you the areas in Great Britain as of oh, uh, six months ago, exactly. Um, none of this was accompanied by an official postcode lookup. Uh, Leicester Council had created an online map showing the area covered by their restriction, and I'm sure others did similarly. But it would have been great if the national body setting the restrictions also had provided a way from the start to look up what restrictions apply to you, or somewhere you're interested in. Um, I'm just going to go through a history now of the regulations as they applied in Northern England um, as they changed. I've made these maps with open data from um, Ordnance Survey um, boundary line product for the boundaries, um, which so showing the change in regulations and where they applied over time. So as you can see, the guidance sort of changed, whether it's like every few days, um, 
very regularly. I've only included the dates where the area's changed. It was, it was quite hard to keep track. You could try looking at your council website, but you might be wanting to visit elsewhere when this was allowed, or you might want to check whether you could visit elsewhere. Um, so what we did have were manually written pages of content that as the areas grew and the restrictions changed frequently, necessarily got more and more complicated. Um, this complexity led to some issues such as in one gov.uk content reorganisation to simplify the presented information because there was quite a lot of it. Uh, Preston disappeared by mistake and the gov.uk page with Oldham in the URL linked to from Oldham Council's website as the page with the details of restrictions in Oldham sadly no longer mentioned Oldham or provided a link to the page that now did have the Oldham information on it. So by mid-September I'd had enough um, and so in a few hours and on my birthday weekend, um, I wrote a postcode, nothing else to do. I wrote a postcode lookup um, in a few hours, uh, which consisted of a total of three files, um, a CSV, manually constructed CSV file of data, the area ID, um, a URL to go to for more information, and a start date for things that hadn't yet started uh, for changes that were coming into effect. Um, a data file of Northern Ireland postcodes, because they were still using a manually constructed list, and then a single PHP file that took in a postcode that someone gave you, looked up in my in Mapit, the areas covered by that postcode, and worked out if you needed to display anything about the, the local restrictions. Uh, I still find PHP great for little thrown together things like this. Um, and quite a few of my, well, train times, I wrote in PHP 20 years ago, that's still running. So <laughs> um, I put the code up on GitHub so others could potentially contribute for changes. And from then on, I kept up to date with announcements uh, pretty much as soon as they were announced. Uh, when Wales announced that Finesley and Carmarthenshire was entry restrictions, the council did provide a postcode lookup tool and map, but that couldn't handle the load and crashed. Um, some big internal GIS tools have not always adapted well to the um, public facing internet. Then at the start of October, Parliament, uh, well, the House of Commons Library launched an interactive map of restrictions, uh, sadly not with a postcode lookup, um, along with a very comprehensive report of the history. A lot of work had clearly gone into their summarising of the restricted information, so I worked out. Uh, where they were using where that information was stored and we used it under their open data license and added it to my site so thanks to parliament for that um, meanwhile the lack of an official postcode lookup tool was getting more noticeable over the following weeks um, since the my tool was mentioned in a written question in parliament on the 10th of october um, and indeed an official gov.uk postcode lookup was launched a few days later on the 13th of october it was fine, um, it worked well, um, even though it only applied to England, which I do understand it's all devolved, um, but still ideally, uh, given everyone, you know, there's a lot of PR about the, the central like gov.uk slash coronavirus, and that's all you'd hope it could in some way be joined up. Um, but I understand the reasons behind that. Um, and one thing it didn't do was handle split postcodes. So what is a split postcode? Uh, postcodes cover a range of addresses. Um, for delivery, um, but sadly postcodes are not really, they're independent of any administrative boundaries like council or constituency boundaries uh, because postcodes are really made for the Royal Mail to deliver mail. So in a small number of cases, about a quarter of a percent I think it is, the addresses in a single postcode can be more than one area. This uh, screenshot is an example of a M19 1TF. The blue markers show the UPRNs, that's the unique property reference numbers associated with that postcode and the red marker shows the centroid of the postcode. So as you can see, some of the properties are in Manchester, some of them are in Stockport. So if you only use postcode centroids for your lookup, as you generally have to if you only have open data, uh, you will, in a small number of cases, give the wrong result to someone. For example, gov.uk's Find Your Council only uses postcode centroids, and so doesn't, for that postcode, give an accurate result for everyone who lives in that postcode. So does Parliament.uk looking up your MP. Um, so in some cases, that postcode is actually not in Stockport, it's in Manchester, and your MP is actually Jeff Smith, the MP for Manchester Withington. Under the public sector geospatial agreement, the public sector has access to the address level data for free for Ordnance Survey, which to me and members of the public would cost thousands of pounds. They could use this data to provide accurate information to when a postcode splits across a council or constituency boundary, asking you to pick your precise address to get an accurate result. Uh, my own council, Birmingham, does this for its uh, council lookup. As you can see, that postcode, they, they've told me it can reside in more than one ward. Um, but sadly, Governor UK and Parliament don't perform this, at present perform this task to find out your local council MP. Hopefully they will do in future, and even more hopefully, they will find a way to release this data openly so that others can do the same. 
uh, closed address data clearly causes problems even to those who have access to it because uh, it was open and easy to use i assume it would have hopefully have been done by now um, now, if you go to my lockdown lookup and enter a split postcode, such as the m 19 tf you'll see that I do show results for both Manchester and Stockport. So given I just said it would cost me £1,000, and I don't think my postcode lookup is worth, worth that expenditure, how am I doing this without access to addressable data? Well, in November, the Office for National Statistics published a new version of their UPRN, if you remember the um, unique property reference number for every um, address in the country, published a new version of their open data set that included every UPRN, its location, and also now which postcode was associated with this UPRN. So when this was announced, I was I was really happy as I thought we could now handle split postcodes with open data, uh, which would be brilliant not just for my lockup, my lockdown tool, but my work at my society with postcode lookups on like to them and they work for you and so on. Sadly, um, non-addressable locations such as post boxes or telephone boxes also get UPRNs. Um, and the UPRN open data released does not include what type of thing the UPRN is, that is still closed data. So whilst I do use this open data on my sites to handle split postcodes, as the data includes non-addressable locations, it will still have some incorrect results, false positives, if, because, because it will sometimes drag a, um, a location past a boundary. So it thinks it is a post split postcode when actually for the addresses in that location it isn't. Um, even if we did have the extra data of what type a UPRN was, it would be fine for my purpose here of showing the uh, restrictions in uh, both possible results. But as I said, for someone trying to find out their MP in They Work For You, when they type their postcode, it's doubtful that they're going to know their UPRN. So even if I knew a postcode was split and I could say here are the UPRNs in one postcode, uh, in one count, uh, constituency, and here are the postcode, here are the addresses, in, uh, the UPRNs, sorry, in the other one, there's no open data of the addresses associated with those UPRNs, so um, it wouldn't be that useful. Uh, hopefully this could also be resolved somehow in future. The closed address data um, seems to hold a, a lot of things back that could be done a lot better if um, it was more open. Um, and then to end, as part of my adding the split postcodes uh, to my lockdown, lockdown lookup tool, it meant that in doing so I discovered the three postcodes that seem to split across the England-Scotland border, uh, which I now present to you here. Um, in one, one case, there's about, I think there's quite a, quite, there's no road between the two of them. So I'm not sure is that helpful to the postman to have them both be in the same postcode. But on the other hand, I, I'm not sure they get much mail. Um, uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I'm just going through the protracted process to turn my webcam back on. Uh, please do um, put questions for Matthew in the chat. I will uh, I will start with one of my own, um, which is, um, well, I've got two actually. So one is that the data for your tool, um, was that a data set that you uh, created through a sort of manual effort on the on behalf of kind of, uh, oh, oh, a manual effort of scraping the content? and sort of curating it into a data set? Or was that something that you were able to take from somewhere that, like through virtue of it being published? Uh, no, so that was just, that was sort of produced open data. Um, I didn't I, I didn't scrape it from there. Yeah, the, the content was too, um, was not, what's the word, scrapable. Um, and there wasn't there wasn't actually that much really. I think that you can look on, look at the um, thing on GitHub, the CSV, even now, even now with the whole history of all restrictions since um, since July in there, it's not, it's only a few hundred lines. Um, and some of which was I went back at the unadded historical ones later on uh, for some for some unknown reason. Um, but yeah, no, it was just, it was just manually constructed. I did have a couple of people um, provide help and like uh, provide data as well. But yeah, that was produced open data rather than consumed open data. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, my other question then was, I suppose, around how much effort, effort it was to keep it up to date. Um, and as you say, I guess the restrictions sort of changed um, reasonably slowly, but then you also sort of mentioned that maybe some people helped contribute um, because it was open in the first place that allowed people to actually say, oh, I can give you some feedback on this. You need to add this line or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, in, in terms of updates, it was, it was generally like they were quite 
you know, generally trialed in the press a bit beforehand. And so um, by the, when, when, it, when they made the announcement in one of the, one of the briefings, it was said, as you say, because it was all very minimal and, and bare bones. It was just, I just had to add a couple of lines to a CSV file. And then um, that was it. It was, it was then up to date. Yeah, excellent. So I've got a question here from uh, Adam in the chat. Do, does the government or councils have openly accessible APIs for accessing data? Do you know if the government publish any source code for their services? So yeah, well, yes. So the well, central government, Gov.uk, published a lot of a lot of source code on on GitHub um, under there. It's called Alpha Gov is their organisation, um, and that, that, that's, I, I've contributed a couple of fixes. Uh, even though I don't work for the government in the past, they um, they got a bank holiday wrong once, um, so I submitted a pull request for that, uh, which was quite gratifying to, to, to do. Um, so yeah, I, I, not all of it is, um, I, but I think they do have one of their of government. Well, maybe the next week we'll, we'll be able to talk more on that. Um, but they, yeah, they do have a propensity, hopefully, to code as much in the open as possible um, for 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 those sorts of reasons. Um, and do they have accessible APIs? Uh, yeah, I think well, there's yeah, quite quite a number um, as part of open data things. There's quite a number of data sets. I think uh, on data.gov.uk. Um, it's still being I used. I'm not sure how keep, kept up to date it is, but um, I've used it recently to get the what was it? Uh, Highways England to publish a data set of their entire network as open data, uh, which I used recently for um, our my site is Fix My Street um, product to know whether you're on a Highways England road or not. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely quite a lot of things out there. Um, not everything, and there could always be more. Um, but I, I understand there's a lot of always a lot of internal issues and things involved in quite a lot of that. Yes, uh, indeed. I, I mean, on that point, actually, um, you mentioned, and this is a <laughs> part of the reason I want to ask you this is because it's a, a topic sort of close to my heart as well. Geospatial data, um, the track record is not super hot, no. I think, um, for the government. Uh, what do you think in your mind, what do you think the best outcome would look like? Um, and what would, I guess, as a, as a kind of call to the people like holding geospatial data still, um, what kind of use cases do you think are um, are only possible with a fully open kind of list of VPRNs or even a fully open address base? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the, the boundary data of where who of your constituencies was only open data in 2010. So I guess I guess uh, things move very move quite slowly. But as to um, yeah, well, a lot of, loads of things I do would be much would be better or easier with open address data um, from from this both go look up um, to like the the services my site you run, write to them. They work for you. They will. They only use open data, and so presently, as I said, for the split postcodes, they will be giving uh, incorrect results for a small number of postcodes. Um, I know Thomas Forth. Um, in um, we talked about he wanted to do a bin day app um, involving address data in Leeds. I think it was, um, and he found that hard or impossible to do without um, open address data. Um, I think just in general, there's so many things that just be able to be done with this data, but it's such a prohibitive cost um, that I don't. I couldn't even think. It's just yeah, but, um, yeah. So many things. I what I'm trying to think of. Um, what else do I use postcodes in? It's just I like postcodes are just using so many things because they're just such an easy piece of data that people know. Um, but yeah. when you when, when they overlap with things where that's where it's not enough, such as the uh, the edge case of of edge boundaries, um, it just seems annoying <laughs> that that data is because of historical presence of the um that we don't have access to that data yeah it's almost the sort of the foundation layer at the bottom of a lot of services i suppose just being able to accurately talk about places in the real world is quite prohibitive if you can't do that yeah and so I, and so uprns they were only made open data last year but you could sort of get the feeling i i, I, I don't have any inside knowledge i've no idea but you have the feeling that they, even that was sort of, you know, they were told to release UPRNs as open data. So they did by releasing literally a list of UPRNs 
and their eastern northern coordinates and nothing else so that uh, you know that that was technically releasing them as open data um but you know, you know unless you already have another data set with more useful information in which you might you very well do it's hard to link up with anything else and the same with this now that this um ONS are, uh, lovely 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 be able to put postcodes in but without the type i wasn't able to um uh, use it completely accurately for split postcodes um and i've got a question from ant um which i might i might kind of add to a little bit if that's all right and so Ant asks how is the quality of government data validated uh, and i suppose kind of an extension to that would be in your eyes are there any data sets that you found um doing projects at my society that have had particular kind of quality issues with them um so yeah well I, so i'm not as i said i'm not i'm not in for you doing any inside information for like audience survey or whatever or what's it but um, they do like seem to have a lot of quality control involved in like in, in postcodes i mean there's a lot of people involved like the royal mail for the postcodes and the local authorities for signing the uh, uprns or the, the the street names and then all the survey to bring these together and i think there's a lot of constant feedback back and forth between them um concerning data i don't think we've as far as i can the postcode data is generally rather good um boundary line which is like the, the product we use for boundaries that again is pretty good they um there are generally a, a few mistakes each release but, you know it's quite a big data set um so yeah overall i mean especially compared to some other data in other in countries that we've looked at i can't i can't i can't really complain about quality fair enough uh well thank you very much matthew that was uh, that was really interesting um and some good <laughs> questions. Um, if you do have any more questions, Matthew, please do put them into the chat um, and we can potentially pick them up at the end. Um, but for now, I will uh, move on to our next speaker who is Sam Roberts. Uh, so Sam is the head of open government and open data policy at the Government Digital Service uh, and also um, has worked and is working on data.gov.uk, which uh, Matthew mentioned just then. 